You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Useless information. Hi, I'm Steve Silverman, and you're listening to a classic episode of the Useless Information Podcast. The story you're about to hear, the kidnapping of Caleb Milne IV, was released on August 5th of 2009. And while it may not be apparent to anyone else listening, I see this episode as a major turning point in the podcast's evolution. And that's because after this, I moved away from retelling stories that I came across in books, magazines, and on the web to finding my own stories, doing my own research, and then synthesizing what I found into what I consider to be a great story. And the story of Caleb Milne IV is the perfect useless information story. It's fascinating, has an unsuspecting twist, and the story hadn't seen the light of day since it first happened back in 1935. I think you're really going to like this one. Welcome to the Useless Information Podcast, my collection of fascinating true stories from the flip side of history. My name is Steve Silverman, and today's story is on the kidnapping of Caleb Milne the Fourth, one of the most obscure stories that I've ever done. But before I do that, I hope you're sitting down because I have some really, really shocking news for you. And that is, if you haven't heard, Michael Jackson died. Now, I'm really, really shocked as to how the media has not done a single story on this event. Such an important thing. You know, this guy was so important to history, and they haven't even said a word about him. Now, obviously, I'm joking, uh, but that does lead to today's question of the day because Michael Jackson, right after he died, basically controlled the top 10 on uh, Billboard's recurring catalog albums chart. And it got me thinking, who had the first number one album of all time? What was the first album ever to be number one on uh, Billboard's charts? And you probably don't know, because I didn't know, uh, but I'll give you a multiple choice question here. So who had the first number one album on Billboard's album chart, which debuted on March 24th, 1945? Was it one, Bing Crosby, two, Frank Sinatra, three, Judy Garland, four, Nat King Cole, or five, Harry Belafonte. Now, I'll let you think about that for a bit, and I'll tell you the answer at the end of this podcast. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning of this podcast, I'm going to tell you a very obscure story. This is one that I just stumbled across while reading old newspapers from the 1930s, and it's the story about the kidnapping of Caleb Milne IV. Now, if you search the internet, you're really not going to find much on this story at all. In fact, I didn't find anything other than a book that he had written or a book that was published shortly after he died. But the story, as I researched it more and more, became very, very interesting. And I thought it'd be something good to share with you. Now, since we're talking about Caleb Milne the Fourth, there also had to be a third, a second, and of course, a Caleb Milne the First. And those people are actually important to the story, at least a couple of them are. So let me give you a little bit of background before we get into the real story of the kidnapping. So let's hop in our time machine and go back to the days of Adam and Eve. Oh, okay, we don't have to go back that far. Let's go back to 1830, Philadelphia, where we find Caleb the Fourth's great great grandfather, David Milne. And David Milne started a very successful textile manufacturing business at the time. And over uh, the, as the years went by, he brought in his sons and his grandsons and so on, and the business was handed down from one generation to the other. In fact, one of the first people brought into the business, and I'm sure you're not going to be surprised here, was David's son, Caleb. So that's Caleb the first. He joined the business in 1859. Unfortunately, this is a little side note, he died by being hit by a taxi cab in London in 1912. So that's Caleb the first. Of course, then he had a son, Caleb Jr., who joined the business in 1885. Then, of course, Caleb Jr. had a son, who was Caleb the third, who joined the business in 1910. And then finally, we get to Caleb the fourth, who never got to join the business. And why? Because the company was liquidated in 1924 after 94 years and four generations uh, being in the business. While the family's business may have been gone, the money was not. In fact, the grandfather, Caleb Jr., still had a sizable fortune to his name. But as you know, and history has shown this many times over, wealth can bring its share of problems. So on December 14th, 1935, the family received the really shocking news that the 23-year-old Caleb IV had been kidnapped. They lured the aspiring actor and short story writer out of his New York City studio apartment by calling him and telling him that his grandfather, Caleb Jr., yeah, that's the rich one, had become critically ill and that he needed to come very quickly to his grandfather's bedside. 
Now, the last time Caleb uh, the Fourth was actually seen, he had asked his landlady for directions to a small park called Gracie Square, which, if you're curious, is at the end of East 86th Street in New York City, basically where it hits the East River. And it was there that uh, Caleb the Fourth was going to meet a Dr. Green and drive off to his grandfather's bedside in Philadelphia, and that's the last anyone saw of him. It seems like just about every kidnapping has a ransom note, and this one was no exception. The first ransom note was received by his brother Frederick, with whom he had shared his New York City studio apartment. And it was the classic ransom note, you know, pieces of newspaper, uh, you know, newsprint that was cut up and pasted to another sheet of paper. And it said the following, in quotes, Your brother isn't in Philadelphia. We've got him out in the country, but he will be returned living if you will follow the letters we will send you. Available cash must come from New York. Keep in touch with your grandfather by telephone. Letters will be signed, Zwittler. And that's the end of the quote. And it just happens that it was not postmarked New York City. It was postmarked Poughkeepsie, New York. This was followed by a second and then a third ransom note. And ultimately, the press learned that a $20,000 ransom had been demanded. Although, after the kidnapping was resolved, it was learned that none of these notes actually specified where and when the money should be paid. So the parents were waiting on, you know, uh, pins and needles for word of their son and where to make this actual payment. But it turns out that the parents didn't have that kind of money. Only the grandfather did. Uh, so it was very clear that the kidnappers knew this, and that's why they say keep in touch with your grandfather. So these kidnappers knew something about the family's history and who had the money. Then a small package arrived in the mail, which contained Caleb the Fourth's wristwatch. But even more disturbing in there was a newspaper, an Albany newspaper that was stained with blood. This was clear proof that he had been kidnapped. This was turning into the Milne family's worst nightmare. Nobody wants to have a child kidnapped. But then five days after the kidnapping took place, this is on December 19th, four motorists spotted something down in a ditch near Doylestown, Pennsylvania. It turns out that it was Caleb the Fourth. His eyes and lips were taped shut, his wrists were bound to his knees, and even worse, there were needle marks found on his arms. And in a drug delirium, he blurted out, and this is in quotes, don't stick that needle into me again. That's the end of the quote. He claimed that his kidnappers had thrown him out of the car. He rolled and landed in that ditch. He was rushed off to the local hospital where he was treated for exhaustion and exposure. Now, the doctors feared that pneumonia may set in, but the young Caleb quickly returned back to good health. So Caleb described his ordeal uh, you know, in great detail to the investigators that were assigned to the kidnapping, and he claimed that he had been kidnapped by a gang of four men and held at some ramshackle house. He also said that he was fed only once in four days and that they repeatedly injected him with morphine. That was the needle marks on his arms. Uh, the investigators uh, continued their search, and they actually found the clothes that he was wearing the day he was kidnapped behind a school that was about a mile from where he was ultimately found. And they followed many, many leads in this case, but no arrests were ever made. And there was a good reason for that. In a shocking turn of events, the one and only J. Edgar Hoover announced to the world on December 28th that the kidnapping was all a hoax. Yes, you heard me. It was a hoax. It seems that the youngest Caleb signed a confession at 4 a.m. earlier that morning that he had faked his own kidnapping. He claimed that he had no intention of ever obtaining the $20,000 ransom from his grandfather, and they did it all to bring attention to his budding acting career. Great acting he did here. It was also revealed to the world that he was living a very, very poor existence in New York City at the time. He received just $10 per month allowance from his grandfather, and he lived with his brother Frederick in a really run-down room. Now, the FBI believed that these horrendous living conditions pushed him over the edge to the point where he's determined to get more money from his grandfather to live on. And here's just a little snippet of his confession statement. This is in quotes again. I admit that my alleged kidnapping was perpetrated by myself. Because of my desperate financial situation and inability to find a job, I felt, since I was seeking work on the stage, that if I could get some publicity, I would get a job. That's the end of the quote. So how did he do it? It was learned that everything was purchased and prepared in advance. That includes the three ransom letters, the package with his watch and the bloody newspaper, and the tape that he needed to tie himself up with. 
first thing he did was he mailed the package from the Grand Central Station Annex Post Office. And then at Grand Central Station, he boarded the train headed towards Albany, where he took the first ransom letter and put it into the mailbox in the back of his Pullman car. He then got off the train. He never left New York City. Uh, and the train continued on up to Poughkeepsie, where it was taken off the train, postmarked, and sent along its way. His next move was to board a bus to Lambertville, New Jersey, where he crossed the Delaware River and walked to Doylestown, Pennsylvania, where he was ultimately found. At that point, he changed his clothes, he taped himself up, and he rolled down a hill towards the road where he was found just minutes later. And for those needle marks, basically nothing to do with morphine injections. He took an ordinary household pin and just stabbed himself repeatedly. Of course, you can't fake your own kidnapping and expect to get away with it. So he was arraigned on federal extortion charges. Basically, he violated U.S. Postal Service rules, and he was held with bail set at $7,500. But his grandfather refused to pay the bail. So his family pulled funds together, and they got him out of jail on January 9th. You may be surprised to hear this, but he never returned to jail, and he never faced trial. All the charges were dropped on February 26th when a federal grand jury failed to return an indictment. He was a free man. But he faced an even bigger punishment, and that is when his grandfather died in 1941, the youngest Caleb was left not a single penny. He got zero cents from his grandfather's $431,000 estate. Now, $431,000 may not seem like a lot today, but if you adjust for inflation, that's about $6.3 million uh, in today's money. Ouch. And so I don't keep you in suspense. You may be wondering, was there ever a Caleb V? Uh, did that budding acting career ever pan out? Well, sadly, no. Uh, Caleb IV died on May 11, 1943 in Tunisia, where if you're curious, it's in the northern part of Africa. He was a U.S. Army stretcher bearer, and he was killed by a mortar round just two days before the end of the Tunisian uh, campaign of World War II. Letters that the youngest Caleb had sent home were published in 1945 titled, I Dreamed of the Day, Letters of Caleb Mill in Africa, 1942-43. Now, if you're curious, just do a search for that, and you'll find that the entire book is available online for free. His story isn't easy to find, but his letters are useless, useful. I'll leave that for you to decide. And now for a few words from our retro sponsor. And now, ladies and gentlemen, your attention, please. Someone once said that the world stands aside to make way for the man who knows where he's going. And so tonight it gives me great pleasure to make way for a man who knows what he's talking about. Harry Von Zell. Don't ever neglect the cold. At the very first sign of a cold, get after it immediately with the faster help of sparkling... Uh, sparkling... Uh, what's the name? Fred Allen, remember? No, no, no. <laughs> the name of the... I'm awfully sorry. That eagle has upset me. The, I, I can't remember the name of what it is that helps fight cold faster. It slipped my mind. Well, it'll come to you. Go ahead, Harry. Well, yes, yes, of course. Ladies and gentlemen, this famous product acts very quickly, yet it's exceptionally gentle. And since the progress of a cold is very fast, the greater speed of, uh, of what it is I'm talking about is especially important in fighting your cold. And that's not all. This, uh, the name will come to me in a minute. It also helps nature counteract the acidity that so often accompanies a cold. And ladies and gentlemen, you can check these facts with your own doctor. You'd better check the name, too, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, Fred, you know what I'm talking about. Why, don't certainly, you? Harry. You're talking about America's outstanding saline laxative. That's it, Fred. And the name is. The name is, uh, uh, so many physicians recommend it. Yes, yes. And it helps fight cold faster. But what is the name? Well, here's a pretty to do. Wait, Harry. There must be somebody around here who knows. If there is, would you uh, please tell us uh, confidentially? Sal That's it, Sal Hepatica. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. It just shows you that having a great name for a product isn't always needed as long as you have great promotion. And that uh, commercial from the Fred Allen Radio Show for Bristol Myers Sal Hepatica, one of the worst names ever chosen for a product, was incredibly popular up through the 1950s. 
Now, if you listen to it carefully, what's really weird is it's a medicine. It's a mineral salt laxative for constipation, yet doctors were recommending it for treating the common cold. Uh, now, if you read any of the print ads at the time, pretty much it would point out that it cleansed your intestinal tract and that it helped to combat uh, acidity in your stomach. Yet here they were selling it for the common cold. Quite an unusual combination. And now for a few totally useless yet totally true tidbits from history. It's time for like to call news of the weird past. And I thought since we were telling a story of a fake kidnapping, I would stick with that theme and tell you three true stories that have to do with fakes or fakers. Our first little tidbit goes back to February 2nd, 1926, where over 500 people in Omaha, Nebraska, reported that they had heard radio broadcasts coming from Cardiff, Wales, Aberdeen, Scotland, and Lyons, France. Well, it turns out that they were all victim of radio fakers. Yes, these broadcasts were made by someone in Omaha, Nebraska itself because it was International Radio Week and someone thought it'd be kind of cool to pretend that these broadcasts were coming from those far away, you know, distant countries. Our next little tidbit goes back to November 25th, 1927, where it's reported in Odessa, Texas, that a guy named William Hansen and another man were slain while participating in a fake bank robbery. It seems that there was a $5,000 reward for the capture of these two men. If you got both, you had $10,000. So they were framed by six other men to think that they were participating in a real bank robbery. Now, three of these men were actually sheriffs. And as the two victims walked into the Citizens National Bank, they were shot to death by the other six men during this fake bank robbery. And our last little tidbit for today goes back to July 29, 1935, where a guy named Robert C. Byers of Columbus, Ohio, bet a friend that he could get front-page publicity for less than $100. But he pulled a Caleb Mill and he told police he was kidnapped. It was a fake kidnapping. So he was fined $50 by the Columbus court for this false reporting. But he was also thrown in jail by Cleveland police and faced another $50 fine. Now, if you do the math, 50 plus 50 is 100. And he said he could get front page publicity for less than 100. So he decided to take a 36-day jail sentence instead of the second $50 fine, so that way he wouldn't lose the bet. But as far as I can see, he did lose the bet because I couldn't find any evidence that he ever that he ever made the front page. The best I could find is page 12. So he lost the bet. And now the answer to today's question of the day. And I asked about the Billboard album chart, which debuted on March 24th, 1945. And I asked very simply, what was the first number one album? Well, it turns out it was by Nat King Cole. He was part of the King Cole Trio at that time. And the album had a very original name. It was the King Cole Trio. It was number one for 12 weeks. Now, I should point out that the chart was not weekly at that point. It was every two to three weeks, and it was only five positions long. If you really want to get technical, when the chart took its modern form, that would be on March 24th, 1956, when the chart went weekly. And the number one album then was Belafonte by Harry Belafonte. So if you chose Belafonte or you chose Nat King Cole, you got it right. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's story on the kidnapping of Caleb Milne IV. Our question of the day on the first number one album on Billboard's album chart, our retro sponsor Sal Hepatica, one of the most unusual names for a product, as well as the three News of the Weird Past stories on fakes and fakers. If you'd like to read more true stories just like this, please be sure to get a copy of one of my books. They're Einstein's Refrigerator and Lindbergh's Artificial Heart. Both are written by me, Steve Silverman, and they're available from your local bookseller, online, and from your local library. If you'd like to contact me for some reason, just drop me an email at useless at steve.silverman.name. That's useless at steve.silverman.name. Or you can visit my website, which is uselessinformation.org, uselessinformation.org. And lastly, as I've said in previous podcasts, I'd appreciate if you could log into iTunes and leave some positive comments to help increase the number of listeners to this podcast. And I should mention the number of listeners has skyrocketed in the last month to month and a half. I am now ranked number six of all the history podcasts on iTunes. So I thank you very much for listening, and hopefully you'll tune in the next time. Bye.